this meeting now yeah. rather than wait for the exact time to begin. Uh, okay. And we are recording. So, hello we, everyone. Well, hi there. So, uh, <laughs> I've decided I need to write some things down, including what are the lessons we're doing today? <laughs> Anybody remember? Yeah, it's 7, 7A and the one after, I think. It stops with uh, okay. personalities. Okay. Very good, very good. So we are only one week behind the other section that I'm teaching. So that's good. Hi, Mark. Hello. Uh, let me get to gallery view here. And uh, let's see. Okay, well, seven, seven, a and eight are uh, actually fairly, well, no, seven is kind of difficult. Um, well, let's just plunge into it then. Let's start talking about uh, lesson seven. The initial point I make, in fact, a point that I will be coming back to numerous times is the idea of thinking in terms of degrees of quantification. In fact, I'm going to step back here and do some long, irrelevant lecturing on. Oh, the, hey, Chris, just double check. Are you recording? Oh, you are. Okay, that's a little button. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> At <Okay>. last. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, I still haven't put up the uh, recording from last week um, because I'm a stupid fool, but I mean, there's no good excuse. Anyway, um, let's see. Quantification, one of the really important ideas of our civilization that we take all too much for granted. Um, and we don't, we have not yet mastered. It is, uh, it is surprising to many people that here's a simple basic concept that are that few people really have gotten on top of. Um, in, at first, I'd like to point out just how unique quantification is as a concept. It really did not, the first people to actually start talking about quantification in terms of understanding reality were the Oxford calculators, a group of uh, theologians around 1300 or so. I believe one of them was Robert Grosstest. And uh, they, uh, these guys were the first people to start saying, well, what if we think about, they were actually worrying about what happens when you throw a rock into the air. And they, they were actually saying, well, what if we actually make a graph of its height as a function of time? which itself was a revolutionary concept. Now there had been lots of calculation and quantification going back thousands of years earlier. The Egyptians, for example, had all sorts of geometric methods and calculations for uh, calculating areas. The Babylonians could actually uh, do some pretty complicated calculations. Uh, for example, uh, one of their standard uh, test questions that we found in one of their little uh, cuneiform tablets concerned a ladder leaning against a wall. And they said, the ladder is this long and it's uh, uh, this high, um, or it, it, the top of the ladder reaches this high. How far out from the wall does the bottom of the ladder stick? Well, that's a trig problem, but it could not be solved. Actually, they, they solved it with just the square root and Pythagorean theorem. Yes, they, they knew the Pythagorean theorem. 
Uh, this was at least 3,000 years ago. Um, so yeah, there were lots of calculations. Uh, Ptolemy, uh, I mean, they had, by, by Greek times, they had the equivalent of trigonometry and they were doing all sorts of really hairy calculations and they didn't have uh, or the what we call the Arabic numeral system. They were doing it in, well, it wasn't Roman numerals. The Greeks had a different system that was essentially, um, essentially boxed out. Um, let's see. I'm going to, uh, I, I've just got an email from somebody. Uh, 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 complaining, uh, nope, not that, come on, undo, and read, 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 so I'm giving him the information he needs to come back again, so, hi there, uh, let's hope, Alex can get in. Anyway, so, and, and if you actually read through his stuff, this guy's doing really hairy calculations. Um, and it was a lot harder back then. So, uh, yes, there was a lot of calculation going on, a lot of math. However, it never really dawned on people that you could arbitrarily assign numbers to real values. They, they did it with astrology and planets and so forth, but they, their feeling was, well, you know, what's up in the sky? This is a different plane of existence. And down here in the dirty real world, we t you can't do arithmetic or quantification. So anyway, the, uh, uh, it really was a big new idea to quantify real things and uh, as a consequence it was a major development uh, one of it turns out one of the uh, uh, or it turns out the the one of the decisive factors in this was uh, Italian merchants by the way I'll mention that uh, much of the big intellectual progress in history has come from merchant societies. The Greeks were the first truly merchant society and they invented all of this stuff. Um, the Italians were the big merchant society uh, uh, before and during the Renaissance. And here we go, Alex is getting in now. Um, the, uh, but actually one of the big breaks, it turned out, was made by a Fibonacci, the fellow who did the Fibonacci series with, you know, spirals and so forth. That wasn't his real contribution to uh, intellectual history. His big contribution was Arabic numerals, which are actually Hindu numerals. Uh, he brought him back to Italy and basically showed the other merchants. He, he was living, his, his father was a merchant in Tunisia and he was living there as a boy and he learned from the Islamic scholars there how, to, how they did arithmetic. And wow, this is a lot better than our stupid ways with Roman numerals. And so he, uh, when he moved uh, to Italy, back to Italy, he uh, told his friends about it and said, this is a much better way to calculate stuff. And the attitude at the time was, so what? We don't calculate. And then they got into the issue of double entry bookkeeping and keeping track of your accounts. And it turned out this was revolutionary because now merchants could actually figure out how they were losing money and where they were making uh, money. And uh, over the course of the next 200 years, arithmetic was the hot topic. Arithmetic was to northern Italy in those times as, say, silicon was to computers. It, you know, it's sort of the driving concept. And if you wanted to get anywhere, your dad sent you to arithmetic school where you learned how to multiply and divide and add and subtract using Arabic numerals. Anyway, 
that then spread through Europe slowly, very slowly. Um, uh, people were continuing to use Roman numerals right up until the 18th century. And even today, we still get stuck with the idea of using Roman numerals for the publication date of a book. You can still see, you know, this book, or even on movies, they'll say, uh, copyright, uh, MCM, uh, uh, L, uh, I, C, or L, X, C, V, I, I, I. Um, you know, they still do that. It's tradition. These old habits die hard. Anyway, quantification advanced very slowly and the big development was applying it to real world stuff. The Oxford calculators were the first ones, but it didn't really catch on. Copernicus used it a lot, but he was, believe it or not, Copernicus wasn't a scientist. He was doing astrology. He wanted to come up with better predictions for planets so he could do better astrology. He didn't, and then only later, I mean, rather late did he say, well, you know, this, this could actually be real, you know? Well, maybe not. He didn't want to get in trouble with the church, so he sort of left it as an insinuation. Anyway, uh, it was uh, Kepler and Galileo who went nuts with this quantification stuff. And that's what started the scientific revolution and blah, blah, you know, steam engines, industrial revolution, computers all culminating in video games. So that's the history of Western civilization. Um, so anyway, quantification is a fundamental concept. And even today, people balk and have problems with it. And I, the example I'll be giving you is personality modeling. You know, if I want to say, John likes Mary 27. That's how much he likes Mary. People, Kathy doesn't know that I'm giving a lecture here. Just a second. Hi, I'm in the court. Oh. Okay. Okay, when will you be back? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, she was complaining that we need to change the duck water. We have ducks in a pond and they shit in the pond and the water has to be changed and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, when I tell people that I'm gonna quantify a person's emotional relationship with another person, a lot of people go, what? You know, they, they find that somehow dehumanizing uh, as if it were, well, well, dehumanizing. You can't reduce me to a number. And the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm representing one tiny dimension of your life as a number. But this concept is, and, and I'm sure it's gonna be difficult for you guys. Now, fortunately, game programmers are already used to the basic idea of representing things like the mass of a projectile or the, uh, you know, the traject the mathematics of moving something across a spatial thing and distance is represented by numbers and so forth. So the basic concept is not alien to you as it is with so many other people. Whoops, whoops, I got it there. Um, however, it is still um, hard on, on a lot of people when we extend this all the way to representing human factors. And I just want to emphasize to you, you can do this just like you can do anything else. Um, one difficulty a lot of people have is dealing with the complexity of the human condition. That is, they'll say, you know, why, <laughs> How can you reduce my life to numbers? And the answer is we don't. Um, we reduce one tiny aspect of your life to a number. And in fact, that really is the essence of all art. If you think about it, um, art 
succeeds by stripping away detail and focusing your energy on on one aspect of the human condition you don't you know when when you see a movie you don't learn everything there is to know about the protagonist uh you know we really don't know what uh uh Luke Skywalker likes to eat for breakfast. We don't know what sport he likes, what sports he likes to watch or play. Uh, we don't know what he reads for entertainment. Uh, there are a million things we don't know about Luke Skywalker. All we know is that he's this young kid who had to grow up and become a man and conquer his fears and blah, blah, blah. Um, because we zero in on that one issue of growing up and trusting yourself and acting on that uh, that's the whole point of the of the very first movie so um that's what art does and that's what you've got to do with a computer only now you're actually reducing it to numbers so the simplest numbers are one bit numbers those are booleans true and false they just one bit it's either true or false and I'm sure you guys are all very comfortable with using Boolean numbers, you know, if, then, else, that kind of stuff. However, a lot of computer scientists balk at going above one bit. That is they, oh my God, two bits? That's scary. Um, but in fact, uh, you know, it's easy. <laughs> Uh, nowadays, we use floating point numbers with like 32 bits or 64 bits even. Um, I was raised, I mean, when I started off, there were people still using octal, you know, three bits. And then uh, we also had nibbles, that is four bit numbers. But most of our work was done with bytes, A bit numbers now boy that's you can get a one percent resolution there um and then we moved up to 16 bits and then from there we jumped to floating point uh even so a lot of computer science people a lot of programming people are uncomfortable with using uh act number you know big numbers for example a lot of cases where I have seen any type of personality trait represented in a game. I mean, for example, in uh, classic role-playing games, we say, well, so-and-so has a stamina of six. They like to use integers. And so if you take the special pill, your stamina increases to seven. And you know, why not, you know, 6.3, 6.91347, you know, what's wrong? Why do you have to use integers? Um, so my advice to you is just use damp floating point. There's just no point in using integers for anything except array indices. Uh, integers are used for indexes, that's all. Uh, if you're actually measuring a quantity, use a goddamn floating point number. Uh, one of the next points I make in uh, lesson seven is that, um, uh, let's see, the logical and and or operators in, for one bit numbers transform into addition and multiplication when you go to multi bit numbers. In fact, if you take one bit numbers and multiply them together, you get exactly the same results as you get with the AND operator. And if you add them, you get exactly the same results as you get with the OR operator. AND corresponds to mul multiplication, OR corresponds to addition. And so one way to figure out when you're trying to build an algorithm is to ask, well, do these two quantities in order for them to produce a big result, do you need both this and that? Or can you use either this or that? If it's either or, you add them. If it's both and, you multiply them. So very simple rule that uh, 
surprisingly, I've had to teach too many people. Uh, let's see, otherwise in lesson seven, I talk about some very simple uh, relationships. Oh, a very good rule of thumb, when you're trying to build an algorithm for something, you know, will Joe get mad if somebody makes fun of him? And you're gonna combine two numbers together to determine whether he gets mad. Uh, one thing you wanna do is just try to decide the relationship uh, that you're looking for and draw a picture. That's one of the first rules I learned in physics was when in doubt, draw a picture, uh, you know, somehow try to visualize the problem and draw a graph. You know, is the relationship linear? If I get twice as much of this, do I expect twice as much of that? Does it rise up steeply? If I get twice as much, do I get four times as much? Does it rise, you know, with a uh, diminishing first derivative? If I get twice as much of this, do I get only half as much of that? Um, you know, draw those curves and then you can easily apply, the simplest is power curves. Uh, you know, take x squared or square root of x, but you can go to any exponentiation. I mean, you can do an exponentiation of 1.5. You know, x, uh, y equals x to the 1.5. Um, uh, you can use, you, if you want to go even wilder, you go to logs. Uh, if you've got a, a function that is blowing up in your face all the time, no matter what you do, you know, if, if, if Mary says, I don't know about how good your hat looks, and Jake blows up and pulls out a gun and shoots her because he's so insulted, you need to tame that function. You need to cut back on his, his reaction. And so maybe you need to use a logarithm there to scale it down. Um, so yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, y you will develop a feel for how all these different operators work. And there is only one way to develop it. And that is to do it. This is a very important point about, it's just like writing. Um, you know, people take courses trying to learn how to write, and what the experts will tell you is the best way to learn how to write is to write. You just keep trying. It's trial and error to the max. And so you just keep doing stuff. Uh, in fact, I had an idea with the previous section. I strongly urge you, uh, when you're getting started with this stuff, build a throwaway project. That is your very first project should be something that you know will stink. Something you can be absolutely certain you're gonna be embarrassed by. But just do it and look at it afterwards and say, yeah, yeah, this really stinks. But in the process, you'll, you'll be able to see why it stinks and you'll get ideas about how to do it better the next time. That, that initial uh, uh, fear of failure is what's gonna hold you <laughs> back. Um, I will tell you, I, much of my success is based on attempting things that I had no reason to believe they would work. Uh, and this goes, all the way back I mean, when I was 12 years old, I decided I was gonna build an airplane, not a model airplane, an airplane that I was gonna fly in. And so I got a cardboard box to sit in and I built wings using uh, slats of wood and so forth. This thing was insane. And I had big ropes on it and my friends were gonna tie the ropes to their bicycles and I put it up on the roof and they were gonna pull me and I was gonna fly. And the only reason I lived to tell the tale is that I had everything set up one afternoon, but it was too late to actually do it. So I just left the airplane up on the roof with the ropes hanging down and said, we'll do it first thing in the morning. It rained that night. And since my plane was had paper, uh, coverings. It was all ruined. 
and that's why I'm alive today. Um, now that was a trial and error that I would not have survived, but I've done all sorts of crazy idiotic things, many of which failed, uh, but every now and then I pull it off and everybody says, God, he's a genius. No, no, I just keep trying stupid things until one actually works. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I, I, there are so many crazy things I've done. I, 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 I will not, uh, I will not go into those, but there are a lot of good <laughs> stories here. Uh, Did so. you ever read the, read the book by Peter Spire, So Bored, Nothing to Do? No, no. I'll, I'll put it in chat here real quick. It's, it's almost entirely um, pictures without text, except for the opening line, So Bored, Nothing to Do. And it's a couple of basically 11 year old kids and they decide to build an airplane and then they do. And it's, it's just this picture book going through everything that happens. And at the very end, of course, their parents catch them, they ground them, they, you know, they're, and they're grounded. Right. And, and at the end of the book, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And, uh, and, and at the end of the book, it's just them sitting around, you know, and it's like out in the country, there's a barn, there's a, but at the end of the book is just them sitting around looking at each other, so bored, nothing to do. <laughs> yeah, and you're just like, oh God, what are you kids going to get? I'll, I'll, put the, I'll, I'll put a link to it up in the, uh, in the chat real quick. It was one of my favorites growing up, so I'll there we go. I'll a couple of the things that I have, a uh, couple of things I did as a kid. One, I played with... Uh, full 110 volt electricity. I actually, I mean, it's very dangerous. You can kill yourself. But I would take electromagnets and undo all the wire because you get really thin wire that way. And I would stick both ends of the wire into the outlet and it would overheat and it would turn bright red and then it would vaporize. <laughs> oh, that was so neat. Uh, if, if my parents had ever caught me doing this, I would have been in so actually, they tolerated me. Um, another good experiment, was, which also required 120 volt power, was a relay. Uh, do you guys know what a relay is? Electromagnet? Oh, God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Dude, I went to school for religion and German. Like, you start talking electricity, or physics, <laughs> and I'm just like, right, exactly, exactly, right? No. Any of you know Jerry what this you, is? I'm gonna guess it's a relay. <laughs> vacuum, vacuum tube, Colin. Vacuum tube. <laughs> is that a cathode? A vacuum tube. Radio tube. This is what before we had transistors, these were what we used. So yeah, my grandpa used to repair ancient radios, and that's exactly he walked me through his shop sometimes and, and that's exactly what he what he would use. Yeah, these are very primitive devices, but you know, actually, in some ways, they're very, very interesting. In some ways, they're better than than transistors, but because they're big and they take enormous amounts of power, ultimately, they're a waste of time. Anyway, a relay is a very simple device. It has a coil, coil, an electro. So when you put electricity through it, the coil turns into a magnet. Then it has a bar sitting over the magnet and the bar has springs pushing it back. And when you put electricity through, it pulls down. And then it has a wire attached to this side, it's made out of metal, and then there are two contacts here. So when the magnet pulls down, it makes a contact with the lower switch. And when you turn off the electricity, it makes a contact with the upper switch. And that's a relay. Transistors do that too. In fact, all transistors and computers are doing essentially the same function. Okay, I, when I was a kid, my dad gave me a relay. Unfortunately, it needed 120 volts to operate, but oh well. Um, and I came up with this brilliant idea. I said, you know, what if we rig it so that the power to it goes through the upper uh, contact. That is, the power comes in here, goes here, goes to the upper button, and then from there flows down to the coil and back. So that when it's relaxed, it gets uh, uh, electricity and that'll pull it down. 
but when it pulls down, it won't have electricity anymore. So that's a contradiction. What will it do? Now, I was like 12 or 13 years old at the time. And I puzzled over that for a long time. Well, we're telling it, here's electricity, turn on. But as soon as he does, he turns off. And that really bothered me until I said, okay, let's try it. And I rigged it up and plugged it in and it went like that. And I still remember rolling on the floor laughing in the garage, immediately seeing, of course. So anyway, trial and error. Do things, do experiments, get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Alan Kay once told me, if you don't fail at least 90% of the time, you're not aiming high enough. Well, I did him one, one better. I failed at least 95% of the time. But uh, don't be afraid of failure. And you will, this is a research field, interactive storytelling. We don't know how to do it. We're, you're just going to have to fail a lot to find the answers. Let me uh, actually answer some questions. Any thoughts on, a, on step functions or other nonlinear functions? Are they ever needed or can you always model with multi-add? Um, I've never been very, actually, I have never used, wait a minute. I think there was one situation where I wanted a step function and that's easily handled with switch statement. Um, Nonlinear, well, I mean, I, I think you're, I mean, you can use logs, exponentials, trigs, you know, there are a million of these functions out here. Uh, one that's a little difficult to use is a Gaussian or binomial distribution when you want something like that. That, it turns out, I've been tempted to use that a number of times and every time I ended up rejecting it. I came up with a nice easy way to fake it that turns out to be more practical for our needs and we'll be getting into that next week I believe. Um, but uh, I don't recommend the you know the any of the bell curve you know the T distribution, binomial, normal, any of those. I was thinking of the uh, ReLU, um, where you have like below, below zero, you know, you have a shallower slope, and then it's like, oh. it's like X, X if it's above zero, or 0.1 X if it's below zero, um, oh. and some functions like that with the nonlinear uh, piece of the question. Well, that's easily handled with, you know, with a Boolean thing, an if statement. Um, but there are ways to do it without uh, uh, without recourse to booleans but with computers it's just so much easier to throw in the if statement so um let's see have you have they ever needed or can you always model with multiplication and addition what i'll say is at the very simple level we're working at nowadays multiplication Division is just upside down multiplication and subtraction is just upside down addition. Uh, the way we're dealing nowadays, multiplication and addition will solve all of your problems. Someday, in the far future, specialists in interactive storytelling will argue about whether we should be using an exponential function with an exponent between 1.5 and 1.7. But that's in the far future. Uh, for now, we're we're really at the tricycle mode. Um, let's see. For the application of and and or, what would be a real life example of XOR? I don't know. Um, XOR does not translate well into an arithmetic expression. Um, I did see it once and I can't recall what it was. Uh, by the way, the exclusive OR function is a beautiful thing for a graphics trick that still, as far as I know, people still haven't adopted. You can use, there's a, a bit of code, it's somewhere on my website, there's a bit of code you can use that will allow you to take two images and blend them together 
in a controllable way. Um, very interesting thing. Uh, uh, let's see. It was used in Prince of Persia to make the enemies without adding memory. Yeah, he didn't have enough uh, memory to put sprites for the enemy, so he exhorted them uh, and turned them into ghosts. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah, you, XOR is a, a very impressive logical function. You can do all sorts of really clever things with it. Um, okay, so let's see. Anyway, with uh, lesson seven, uh, oh, and then I conclude lesson seven with an algorithm for creating algorithms. Um, just a simple procedure you can use for generating algorithms for personality reaction situations. And uh, it's a very good way to start. You'll develop your own little variations on that, but uh, start with that. Okay, next is uh, 7A, simulation for dilettantes. Really, all that is is a um, just a listing of a bunch of simulation things I have done over the years where the source code is available on the on my website you can look it over um, I mean yeah if you got a lot of time to kill you could go through all of those things you could spend a long time digging through all that code How, whoops whoops I didn't see somebody wanted in uh, let's see uh, but you could uh, you could also waste a lot of time. The two I will, the two programs that I think are most useful, probably the most useful is Balance of Power because it does go into some detail. And there's a book explaining how all of those algorithms actually work and why I did them that way. So to get a really good idea of how you go from you know, subtle ideas about diplomacy and geopolitical relationships right down to code. Uh, that entire evolutionary process is, is uh, laid out in great detail. And so that would be of use to you. The only problem with it is that I had to do balance of power on the Mac before we had fast floating point calculations. And so I had to do everything with 16-bit integers. Have you ever done calculations with small word sizes where you scale things up before you divide them down so you stay in the range of the word? You've never heard of anything like, yeah, I know. That's when, it, wait, I've got to show you something I showed the other people. Um, someday, you might find it useful to learn how to handle arithmetic calculations with small word sizes, um, just as you might find it useful someday to learn how to make flint tools. You know, under the right set of circumstances, this might come in handy, and the same thing goes for doing integer calculations with small word sizes. It's an ancient technique that at one time was extremely valuable and nowadays is a complete waste of time. And that will make it difficult for you to understand the Balance of Power book because all of the calculations are done with integer arithmetic. And over and over again, you'll see me taking this number and multiplying it by a big number to get something really big, and then dividing that down by another number to get it back in scale. And uh, it's confusing. So uh, the other one that I will recommend, you're not ready for yet, but the balance of the planet software shows how to build a big system of equations. One of your difficulties when you're building any person, any interactive storytelling, any big system like that, is you got a whole bunch of equations and they're feeding back into each other and so forth. And it is all too easy for these things to run away on you. 
you know, a little number goes in here and turns into a big number, and then that turns it into a gigantic number, and ah, you get all this craziness going on. Taming a system of equations is difficult, and I've learned how to do it very well, and I ended up doing that with uh, Balance of the Planet. I had something like 80 equations all feeding into each other, and a system like that, at first glance, appears to be just flat impossible. You, you, know, you cannot possibly tame a system like that. Well, I came up with a way of doing it. They're all linear equations. And so uh, I just came up with a way for adjusting the coefficients and that made it manageable. Anyway, uh, if, you, if you are ever in a situation where you got too many equations and they're just going wild, you might want to take some time and study balance of the planet. Okay. Uh, moving on to lesson eight, personality models. Whoa. Um, first, a really basic point. Everything is a model. Everything. Every word you use is a model. Uh, uh, here is what I used this last time. Um, for example, the word rock. This is a rock. Uh, this is a rock too. The word rock applies to both of them, but it doesn't specify either one of them. That is, rock is a model that specifies only a few of the high, of the most general aspects. One, it's hard. All rocks are hard. This is a rock, therefore it's hard. Um, let's see, it, uh, it sink, it's dense. It's, if you throw it in water, it'll sink. That's true of all rocks except pumice. Um, you know, you can make, a word is a model and a model is something that specifies only a few characteristics of an entire class of objects. The whole point of a model is that it applies to many different things. There's model, in fact, think in terms of a taxonomy. You have model at the very top, and then that, like rock. And then you can break that down into submodels like igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic. And then you can break those down to particular minerals. And then you can break those down to specific rocks. This rock is an igneous rock that is blah, blah, blah. And you can say it has a little dent right here. And it's somewhat roundish, but it has an inclusion right here. And you can get into all the specifics of this specific rock. But if you're talking about a, if, a model, you're talking about something that has to apply to an entire class, to many different versions. That's what makes it useful because you can use a model to handle many different characters. And so if you're gonna have a cast of characters, you're gonna need models for those characters. And those models are personality models. I will mention right off the top, there's a standard mistake everybody, use, everybody makes, and that is, let's use the model that psych psychologists have developed. Because psychologists have been studying human personality for many, many years. And they have developed a number of personality models to describe human behavior. The most common of which is called the five factor model or the ocean model, which has five basic traits that define a human character. And uh, uh, there, are, there have been millions of papers done where they measure these and end up showing that people who have a lot of this trait tend to you know, be child rapists or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's an enormous amount of stuff there and it is very tempting to say, well, I'll use that because I can find all, almost anything I wanna know about that. The problem with personality models from psych psychologists is that they describe people. There are no people in stories. There are characters. People are boring. Characters are interesting because characters do things that people wouldn't do. For example, would you have taken the red pill? 
I wouldn't, I would have taken that blue pill. I'm going back. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, so most people will do the safe, prudent thing. You know, if you got a situation here and I mean, horror movies all the time. Here's a little girl driving up and saying, oh dear, I need to use a telephone. Oh look, there's a great big scary house over there. I'll just go in and ask them if I can use their telephone. And the door creaks open and it's dark inside. And she says, oh, maybe I can find a light switch. And you, no, don't go in there. And she always goes in there because she's not a real person. She's a character. Um, and you need characters in stories. The last thing you want is a story about real people because, you know, the story is going to be, well, I sat there picking my nose for a little while and then I realized I had to go to the bathroom. So I went and went uh, to the bathroom and while I was sitting on the toilet, I started reading my, uh, my smartphone. There was an interesting thing on social media about, about a friend of mine who likes to eat chocolate cake with pimpernel, uh, pimpernels in it. And I thought that was really funny. So then I went on and on and on, all boring. So, uh, real people are boring. Don't do real people. Don't use the psychology models. You need a, a personality model that can be used to describe interest or to determine interesting decisions by interesting characters. And I'll tell you, I have worked on personality models for many years. And I will admit that the personality model I describe in the lesson, I'm dissatisfied with it. It's not good enough. I am quite certain that the first term in the model, namely bad good, is uh, that's a good one because that really, that's handy. You use it a lot. You know, nice people do nice things. Nasty people do nasty things. So, you know, that, that helps. That's a useful uh, variable. The next one, um, faithless honest, is only useful if you have a, a story world in which people tell lies or break deals. And you can't do that unless there are deals. And by the way, setting up deals, oh, deals are a constant element of human relationships. We make a million little detail, uh, deals all day long. Uh, geez, honey, I'll take out the garbage after I've finished uh, watching this show. Uh, that's a deal. Um, anyway, the, uh, you can't apply dishonesty to a situation like that unless you can actually set up a deal structure and a way of verifying whether or not the deal has been honored. Uh, you cannot, uh, uh, have a system for lying and telling the truth unless that is dramatically significant. And there's a way of tracking everything that has happened and what everybody has said about it. And uh, <clears throat> I actually did that. There is a, uh, a computable way to handle that. Um, and maybe someday I'll tell you about it, but uh, it's, it's messy. Uh, the third one is timid dominant. And that is significant, but a little hard to apply. It's basically, you know, how pushy people are. And that, yeah, that's definitely has some utility. But then there are a million other attributes that you'd like to have in a personality model. Uh, uh, one obvious one is uh, uh, ugly, sla uh, uh, ugly, sexy. Another one is, uh, represents how lustful a person is. And you could have things, there are, there are a million things you could throw in. The danger here, everybody makes the same mistake. They put too many variables into the personality model. And they always get in trouble doing that. The problem you run into with your personality model is that you have to actually use the damn thing. It's really great to assemble this nice little model with all these variables and scales and so forth. And boy, you just feel like this is really good. But when it comes time to use it, where you're in a situation in a story world where 
here's this character who has just, you know, this event has just taken place and the character is saying, oh, geez, what am I going to do about that? And you had to write an algorithm for the decision the character makes. You're going to be asking questions like, well, is it based on how good or, or you know, uh, bad or good that person is? Uh, or how much he likes or dislikes somebody, or what if he's, uh, you know, loyal or not loyal? And uh, maybe that should go in. And what you find yourself doing is spending hours worrying about which variable should be applied, and you end up writing this huge, long algorithm with all these little traits scattered through it, and then there's no way to balance it. When it comes time to rehearse your story world and actually see how things happen. You get all these crazy results and you got to dig down through these complicated algorithms and figure out what term went out of control and it, it, you never get anything done that way. I have expended hundreds and hundreds of hours on this type of problem and I will tell you it is much easier to keep it really simple and over apply than under apply. That is, I'm going to use bad good for all sorts of decisions, even if they doesn't really quite apply. It's, I'm just going to make it apply. Uh, you will find you will get more done that way. So uh, uh, this is another re Oh, this is why you need orthogonality. I mentioned that in the thing. Orthogonality is a fundamental requirement of any personality model. That means that every attribute in the model must be completely, totally independent of every other attribute. If two of them are somewhat parallel, for example, uh, bad, good, and stingy, generous. Those are different, but they're not orthogonal. That is, a bad person is seldom generous, and a good person is seldom stingy. Uh, it is possible, but rare. And so you can be in a situation where you say, well, should I use bad good here or stingy generous? And which is more appropriate? And it's not worth it. So uh, I guarantee what will happen is you'll be in a situation where you'll say, you know, none of my attributes in my personality model apply here. I'll throw in a new attribute just to deal with this one situation. And it just carrot runs and runs and it goes on and on and you end up in hell. So don't make that mistake. Um, let's see. Uh, question on personality models. When did you add hedonism into the mix? I did that under the urging of a person whom I will not name, uh, who, oh, darn it, Lorenzo, sorry. People keep getting bumped off and then wanting to come back in and I, there we go. Um, let's see. Um, and this person really felt that hedonism was a critically important uh, attribute. And so I stuck it in and uh, turned out it wasn't used that often. And really helped that. So in general, yeah, you can add these things. And, and I'll mention that for some purposes, if you have a very narrowly defined story world, the narrower the story world is, the more explicitly appropriate or the more specific your personality attributes can be. For example, if you want to have a story world about playground bullies, right. Lorenzo, could you mute yourself? Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, if you want to have a story world about playground bullies, in, in, <laughs> I think Larissa <Lurzer> left. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, then there are all sorts of personality attributes that you don't need because it's a very narrow story world. You definitely want to have something for like timid dominant. Um, and maybe bad good, but 
you know, you're not going to need anything about sexy or uh, lustful or greedy or stingy or generous. None of those things will be significant. So uh, really, at this, by the way, when you build a story world, don't start off saying, I'm going to build a story world about, you know, life. Uh, you know, the world. Uh, you need to start off very specific. Say, I'm going to build a story world about this particular type of emotional problem. Uh, you could do one about uh, adultery, say, although even that's getting a little complicated. Um, but again, the more narrowly you defined the n define the nature of the interactions that you have, the easier it will be. Again, you want to start off with Crawford's first law of software design. What are the verbs? Ask yourself, what, what verbs do I want my player to be able to do? What should the player, uh, what should the main things in this story world be about? What type of interactions do I want to focus the player on? And you want to strip away everything that is not directly relevant to the central ones. You need to be brutal here. Uh, remember, the shadow defines the light. What's not there is just as important to, re to the information content as what is there. So uh, let's see. Can you talk a little about timid dominant? Yes. The problem with timid dominant is that its perceived value is pretty much the same as its intrinsic value. That is, uh, see, timid do not dominant is, is intrinsically a relationship thing. It is about how you relate to other people, whereas bad good is more intrinsic. It's more in your heart. Um, so it's, it's a little difficult there. Basically, timid dominant, uh, specifies how pushy a person will be, how insistent they will be on getting their way, how assertive they are. Um, for example, uh, classic thing is, uh, how does a character react to an insult? Somebody just called him stupid. Um, a dominant person will be more likely to push back, whereas a timid, timid person will be more likely to just act like it didn't happen. Um, so I, I will tell you, though, that I have had some problems with timid dominant. Um, it, it can be a bit messy at times. But if you just limit it, it, it is useful when you just limit it to the issue of assertiveness. Uh, what does it mean for a 0.4 bad good person to interact with a zero bad good person? I'm having trouble conceptualizing what a conversation between these personality profiles would look like. <clears throat> um, well, now here we're getting into some stuff about B numbers, which is next week, but basically we're talking about a moderately good person talking to a nor interacting with a normal average everyday person. Um, and that depends entirely on what they're interacting over. Uh, you know, for example, will he hold the door open for the other person as they're walking through if they both go through. So uh, without the context, it, it doesn't tell you anything without context? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's in the context of behavior. Uh, remember Aristotle in the Poetics said, uh, behavior reveals character, or character is revealed through action. Uh, and so uh, these personality models are used to decide action. That's the only use for them. You're not, again, you're not trying to capture the true nature of humanity. You are trying to come up with a set of numbers that you can use 
in algorithms that make dramatic decisions for characters. The character is, and again, we're talking about a model in the sense that it applies to many, many different cases. We've got all these events taking place and how does this character react to this event? How does that character react to that event? The personality model has to apply to all of those combinations of events and characters. So, uh, <clears throat> but again, concentrate on what it is used for, not what it is. This is again, process thinking as opposed to data thinking. Don't think about the personality model in data terms, is it, is it accurate? Think of it in process terms. What am I using it for? Uh, how, you know, when will it be useful? When will it be an obstacle, uh, difficult? What's the finest simulation model of our time? Well, it, you know, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, right now I would say in terms of strict simulation, certainly the most complicated models are the climate models. And I say that only because there have been thousands and thousands of people working on these things for decades now. And so, you know, they're, they're, the, these are called the CMIP models. And this has been a team effort of scientists all over the globe, and they're all sharing information. This is definitely a, a Borg type of thing, you know, the, 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 the hive mind has been producing these models and, and working on them. And you know, so they've got to be really, really uh, good by this case. And in fact, all of fidelity tests, I, I've read, I read a lot of these scientific papers because I'm interested in the subject. And uh, Jesus, they are really hairy. They, I mean, the details they go into, um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, come on, part, uh, you know, uh, the size of the little tiny water droplets inside a cloud. Major controversies! <laughs> it's just, anyway. Um, Got to hop off for an interview I'm having. Thanks for this. Oh, okay, Alex. Uh, let's see. Look at your interview. Uh, no, this is Alex saying he's got an interview. Uh, wait. Yeah, so um, I skipped Mark's question. You kind oh, of answered it. On but... operational variables, what are other common measures you found yourself using more frequently in story worlds? Oh, yeah, I did skip that. Um, well, I would say I've used bad, good, and P bad good, the perceived value of it, for it, maybe 50% of the time that, that ends up getting used. Uh, false honest, less than 5%. P false honest, about the same. Timid dominant, oop, here we go. Timid dominant has been used um, maybe 10 or 20% of the time. Um, the, then there are, there are a variety of, oh, there are also moods, which I forgot to mention, and I told myself, make a note, Chris, I've got to discuss moods in there. Uh, moods are another personality trait that I, um, assign, uh, I try to avoid moods because they require constant treatment, basically a certain event can trigger a jump in a mood. Uh, obvious example is anger. You, know, you insult somebody, whoosh, their anger jumps way up and then it starts falling off. Well, this falling off process is done, uh, has to be attended to by the outer loop, every single passage of the loop. So that I'm still, I still count machine cycles. Maybe I should should give up on that now, but uh, Anyway, moods jump and then they fall. Uh, the primary moods I have used are, um, let's see, I forget what the negative version of anger is, but uh, I'll call it just pla a peaceful angry, but it's not quite that. No, Stoicism. fearful angry, that's right. Um, 
and then another one is disgusted, aroused, and then the last is sad, joyful. Uh, believe it or not, those connections may strike you as a little odd. You know, how do we get from disgusted to aroused? Turns out uh, there's a connection between these in hormones. I, in some many years ago, in doing my research, I found that uh, the same hormone that is involved in uh, sexual arousal also inverted produces disgust. And uh, similarly, uh, uh, fearful and angry, those are really fight or flight, uh, same hormones at work. Um, and uh, sad, joyous, again, serotonin, etc. So um, anyway, uh, yes, moods are also of great utility. Uh, and I'm pretty, actually, I feel better about those three moods than anything else in the personality model. Those seem to be really basic and seem to apply in just about all the time, one way or another or they are, can be used just about all the time. Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, perceived values are likely to change, but how likely to change in your experience with your stores or other values? Oh, yes. Uh, the general rule I have used is that intrinsic traits do not change. Per only perceived values change. Um, now, in fact, a great deal of storytelling is about how an intrinsic trait changes. We, uh, you know, the character undergoes a crisis, and as a result of the crisis, the character changes. And that's the whole point of the story. Uh, yeah, you can do that. The problem is, you're not going to change your player. So, um, are you, do you want to have him change another character? Well, maybe you could make that a point, but for now, I strongly urge you to stay. That's my wife. Uh, hello, I'm still with the course. Oh, okay, let me wrap this up and then I'll, I'll call you right back. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, sorry, Kathy is out shopping and she can't find her wallet and she's afraid it was stolen and she needs me to check the house. So I gotta wrap this up very quickly. Uh, I, yeah, goodbye, <laughs> that's about all I can think of right now. So, uh, I will see you guys next week. We are doing um, uh, numbers and B number stuff, B number mass. This is a completely different way. This isn't arithmetic. This isn't a mm -hmm. multiplication. Completely different mathematical system that I developed just for uh, interactive storytelling. And I've been using it for 20 years now. And I am, I very much believe this is the way to go. So, uh, oh, one last thing. Build, if you want to get started, do a story world of just affinity statements. Uh, look at my gossip game. Mm -hmm. That's the simplest possible story world, the statement of affinity. I like you. I don't like you. Joe likes him, but Joe hates her. That's the simplest possible story world. It is the most common form of human social interaction. It's a great way to get started because it involves only one variable. If you want to get snazzy, you can throw trust into it, but it's a good way, good uh, beginning story world. So with that, I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. All right. Hey, Chris, great lesson. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. It's good to see you all again.